Hi, my name is Justin Sinceri. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and your fellow trauma nerd. Welcome to the Polyvagal Podcast and part two of my chat with the amazing Irene Lyon. Last time in part one, we ended kind of on a cliffhanger where she was just about to discuss uh, good shame versus bad shame. We talked about the bad shame and now she's going to talk about good shame. Welcome back. What's the uh, what's the good shame? Ah, so this is controversial, but it's to me, the more I see and the more I've seen kids and work with people and my own upbringing and I have a stepson, so we've seen this too, is healthy shame is teaching a child right from wrong. It's what needs to happen so that they stay safe. Okay. I'll give an example in a second. So my most pivotal memory, not pivotal, but memory of healthy shame when I was growing up, I don't know how old I was, but I was old enough to cut bread at the, at the kitchen counter. Right. I had this little thing that slid out that was quite low actually. So it was fine for kids. And I had, uh, pretend that's the knife. I had the knife and I was cutting the bread, like with the knife pointing towards my face. <laughs> Not good, you know, but I'm young. I don't know that. Right. And so my dad was at the kitchen table eating and I hear this Irene turn the knife the other way. You're going to hurt yourself. You know, it yeah. wasn't, Hey sweetie, you might want to look at what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you should. It was, it was like deep voice, right. which we know again from Porges's work, yeah. sense a bit of a fear response. Into danger. Us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was like, this is dangerous. Turn the knife the other way. What's so crazy to this day, if I'm rushing and I'm doing something similar, because now, of course, I have more dexterous control of knives. You know, you cut an avocado. Like, I will, like, don't do that. I will hear his voice. Really? You know, it, and it isn't like in those words, yeah. but it's like, nope, it's other way. Yeah, yeah. It's a reminder. Yeah. And so healthy shame is that. It's teaching don't put your hand on the hot stove. You'll hurt yourself. Um, it is don't pull the dog's tail. He will bite you. Right. All these, you know, don't hit your brother. Like, I mean, this is where, you know, people, people be like, Oh, well, you just said that healthy aggression is good. This is where we have to be finessed. Right. We have to know when is right. When is wrong. It's like, so oh, yeah. health shame, what it does is it instills a biological sense of this is not right, and it has to go yeah. into the biology. Because if it doesn't go into the biology, we will not feel it, and we won't learn the lesson. If it's just... No, I got you. Yeah, it's just a memo. I, I have no oh, problem with that. that. And that's yeah. way different than a parent calling them names and yelling, and yes. how could you do something like that? And that's Totally. Really, okay. Wait, but let, yeah, so let, let's yeah. take this to uh, another place. Let me challenge you a little bit oh, here if I can. Totally. <laughs> when you give a kid time out, aren't you saying that behavior was not appropriate? You need to go sit over there by yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, timeout can look many different ways. And I've heard some, sure. I've heard some that oh, it's I like, know. that's not a timeout. That's abuse or torture yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, a parent yeah. calmly saying, look, you, you broke the rule. You, you've had plenty of warnings. We've attempted this, blah, blah, blah. Like yeah. you go sit on timeout for a little bit for, for three minutes or not, sorry, not three mm -hmm. minutes too young, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. you're, you're six years old, six minutes, you know, one year per year, one minute period of life and I'll check in with you when you're done. The parent goes yeah. over after the six minutes, you know, I love you so much. And like what happened there? And um, mm -hmm. let's do some problem solving and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So to me, Why that's, not just, yeah, what? that that's you. Yeah. You could say that that's more appropriate and it is more appropriate than toxically yeah. shaming. Like you Absolutely. piece of whatever, go sit there, Yeah. but it's still isolating them. Right. And so why not be with them, let them get out whatever has to get sure. out and be with them on the get go, as opposed to then being with them after the three like, minutes. Right, right, right. And this is where, um, Gabor Mate actually has some really great resources around, um, children and parenting. Um, and he talks about why timeouts are just barbaric, even when they're done with care yeah. is that 
that kid is acting out for a reason. And I mean, I'm going to hope that there's not an eight year old being put into timeout. Cause that's like, that's not good. Mm. Right. Like that's old. Like you should know by eight. Should. Yeah. yeah. Right. You should. Um, and at that age being said, you know what? You're grounded is different than three or four or five. Right. You know, like there's a, you got to look at the scape of, of the, or the scope of age. Yeah. And so it's like, why not be like, okay, like what's going on? You know, like what's happening? Uh, yeah. Ideally the, all, right, the, that, all that stuff takes place before the fact. And this like is where it gets. before the behavior totally, ball or whatever. Totally. And this is where it gets tricky because uh, it's so tough because if, the upbringing wasn't everything that we've talked about. That's like the more perfect situation. And then you try to change that when those patterns have been set, it's going to be a little, a bit of a tug or it's like what mom was just telling me to be isolated forever. And now, um, I am in a place where she's saying this, like that's like, I, and then you get confused, right? You get totally confused. Because, well, this was yeah. the way it was, and now you're telling me it's this way? Well, what is it? And then you almost don't believe it because it's like, mm, I'm not so sure I'm buying into this, and now I'm going to just resist it even more. Totally. Right? And, and so this way that it's like, well, I want to give you a hug, and I want, like, let's do, like, let's be connected. And it's like, whoa, whoa. Oh, no, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that's, again, that's that, where it gets tricky. That attachment because... has to be there. And I think, in my opinion, consequences do nothing unless there's some sort of attachment. Yeah. Hopefully, you won't even need it in the first place. But yeah. But I, I work with plenty of kids who their parents yeah. give too many consequences and not enough attachment, and it's a disaster. Right. Yes. Yeah, because then it becomes kind of like a like it's like the military. Oh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But at least in the military, right. there's some level of predictability and you can rely sure. on the next person next to you. And so many kids are raised in homes where there's not. There's nothing. And they get exactly. way too little. But even like exactly. with, with timeouts, and I, after in the real world, I say in the real world, or when, once you're an adult, mm-hmm. if you're not a good friend, if you hit your friends, and, you know, they're not going to want to be around you. They're going to say like, go away. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and, and that's a normal tribal, I think, sort of like Completely. healthy shame kind of thing, right? Completely. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's, it's interesting because you say tribal and that's true. Cause like back in the day <laughs> right. in the tribe, yeah. if you did something that wasn't right, that's detrimental to the whole community. Right. Right. You, I, I can't give an example right now, no, but it's you, like, yeah. you know, it's like, and back in those days you were like, you were isolated. Right. Like if you really did something wrong, like you're not safe for our safety, our, our, our ability to live as a, as a, as a community, right. small community, you get ostracized. And so that's extreme. And so, yes, like if someone does something that's not cool, the natural thing is we don't want to hang out with you. Right. And that sucks for kids <laughs> that, you know, I mean, it's just, it's but it's kind a natural, of this to me, that's thing. a natural consequence. It's totally natural consequence. And here's the thing is like, okay, so Lenny, little Johnny just did something really mean. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, we don't want to hang out with you anymore. We want to hope that little Johnny can find a way to deal with that. But if he right. can't make up in your mind the scenario where little Johnny totally. ends up going next, you know, totally. he isolates himself. He's mad. And the reason why he's probably done something mean is because his environment at home, maybe, or it's in the case of Ted Kaczynski, something really bad happened to him. And he's just trying to get it out because, oh, my God. I can connect with these friends and now I feel safe. And the moment the safety comes up, what does that allow the system to do? It allows it to express all the stored stuff that has been in there forever. But when you're in a dynamic of little kids, they don't have the capacity to know that that, that's what's going on. Oh, no, no. Right? No. Of course not. And the the kids like little Johnny that does whatever to his little peers and they reject him. mm -hmm. Can he handle that or not? I, I would think if he comes from a home where that has there's no healthy, safe bond, attachment, and connection, then no, and all it does is reinforce his behavior. Exactly, exactly. And so then you know, and so there's there's so many avenues there, but yeah. you get it, right? I would appreciate yeah. you letting me challenge you on that. 
Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> I've already forgotten what it was. What was it? <laughs> uh, oh, con- it was well, like really, a- it was kind of like talking con- about consequences. You'd mentioned time out right. and shame yeah. and unhealthy shame or a toxic shame. Um, oh, the other. I mean, the other thing with that too, um, because no doubt there'll be people listening to this. Because I, I, a lot of the questions I get are how how do I teach my kids healthy aggression? Like how do I? Good question. Foster. This? Interesting question. And. It is, and it's tricky because if someone's asking that question, then they probably don't know what it is themselves. Yeah. And so, yeah. so there's sort of maybe two parts to that is <clears throat> we as the caregiver, and I say caregiver very carefully because you don't have to be a parent no, yeah. to have interaction with kids, right? Totally. You as the caregiver, as the adult, we want to have the capacity to deal with being uncomfortable in the face of an immature nervous system acting out. And if we join with their immaturity, we're only going to get more immaturity back. Like, right. So it's that example of some of the timeouts and militant parenting. It's like, that's not like, that is not, that's immature. It's unevolved. Mm -hmm. It's not evolved. And so when someone is having that meltdown and they're being bad, quote unquote, I'm using air quotes there, how is that triggering or triggering our own stuff? Right. Right? Are Absolutely. we embar- are we embarrassed? Is this putting us oh, out totally. of our yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And so it's like that that's where again, holy cow, this is a lot of energy. I hate it. I don't like it but you don't say that to them. Right? Like that's a little conversation you have in your head. It's like, and that's where you would maybe take a deep breath and like, okay, oh. let's, 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 let's figure this out. Um, and then in terms of modeling, I don't know, I was talking to someone the other day about this, or maybe it was a video I was doing, but it had to do with how to teach kids healthy aggression. I say they actually know we have to learn from them yeah. through the way they play, the way they express, the way they dance, the way they zoom across the park, you know, like this whole don't run too far. It's like if it's safe, let them run as far as they want. Oh, yeah. you know, they'll come back, actually. That's what's interesting, <laughs> you know, is they will come back. But the moment, like, don't go too far. It's like, oh, well, what happens if I do go far? Yeah. Right. So there's this sort of interest that you have to trust. And of course, if you're like on a cliff at the Grand Canyon, right, totally right. different. But if you're in an open, this is why it's so important for kids to have open space where you can see them and they can just explore and you know it's relatively safe. Right, right. Because for them to go and come back and go and come back actually forms a diff, that kind of healthy attachment. Yeah. And what is happening a lot that I see, because I live right by a park, Oh, I don't have my phone near me. Uh, oh, they do. So it's like, so I'm the mom on the bench. Sorry, moms, if you do this, but don't do this. If I'm just like talking to someone, yeah, I'll meet you in two seconds, put it down. But if I'm like this and playground is there, if that kid does something that they feel really good about oh, and, yeah. they, and they look totally. to you and you're like this, <sighs> shut down. It doesn't mean that you have to praise them. It's like, holy, that's so cool. You know, or if they do get hurt and they look up and you're looking at your phone, no one's there for me. And so there's something about how we play with kids. So this goes back, how do we foster healthy aggression? Well, I can't answer that with specifics. It comes back to how are we engaging and interacting with not just our kids, but like if you and I went out on a, you know, movie date, and I was just staring at my phone the whole time that the movie was ha- like, that's not cool. No. You know, it's like, so why would yeah, we do that to kids? Right. It's and a so that's in the relationship, right? Completely. And so those little things, those attunements, attachments, yeah. letting them be free, but being connected to them and not yeah. being yeah. overbearing all creates that healthy aggression and that sense of self. Right. Totally. Complete I, sense when, of you, self. when you, when you ask that yeah. question, my mind went to, um, if, if they're able to express themselves, the healthy aggression is just, you don't have to teach it exactly, right? You don't. You don't have to oh, lay God, out. No. Here's what you do. Here's step one, step two, step three. It's just, it's just there. Yeah. And they have enough we, strong enough connection to be able to know. Yeah. Not up here, no, but like, 
they in, yeah. viscerally know, yeah. somatically know. And what you just said is so bang on because the reason we have these conversations and we have all this work that's the body of work that we practice, it's because of these ruptures. It's because of misattunement. It's because of stored trauma. If we didn't ha if if we were like the geese and the animals in the wild who just raised our kids the way that it's supposed to happen, we would not have a job. <laughs> I know that sounds really weird. That's my, no, I, that's my goal is to put right? myself out of a job. I, I basically, I'm like, maybe I don't need to train people because maybe by the time I'm like 120, <laughs> we won't need this anymore, right? But that's kind of what it comes down to. Like the only reason we have this industry, self-help, mind-body, health, other than, you know, mm -hmm. No. severe medical things yeah. is because of this, yeah. you know, and Porges's work, like the polyvagal work, his understanding of what we need as mammals, to me, there's no question. Like it actually should just be law. I know that's a bit of a bold statement, but you know, why are we not making this mandatory for people to learn and understand, um, you know, in, in, in not in other cultures, but in some of the other more real woo-woo stuff that I study, more universal kind of stuff, like people can't just have kids for the sake, like they have to be trained and bred and groomed before they can procreate because they want to create a being that is as solid and as regulated as possible. It's a big responsibility. It's a huge response. It's a, it's the biggest job in the world because you're creating the most complex system in the world, mm. right? Like yeah. we're the, we're still to this point in time, as far as I know, even with all the fancy computers we have, the human system is still the most complex machine on amazing. planetary yeah. earth. Yeah. And that's serious. <laughs> and you know, it's so serious to the point where it's almost, um, ridiculous how little we do to teach people how to and, and then there's some people that have it naturally because they were treated well when they were brought up right, right, right. right? and so it's this weird you know you it's like you almost have to separate and then that's not cool so i don't know it's weird yeah i don't, I don't know the easy answer to it besides just continually putting stuff out there putting stuff out there mm -hmm. light bulbs go off all the mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. so hopefully these, yeah. these little pockets of uh getting unstuck or being healed it's changing you know, if I think back to when I first started this work really consistently, at least online and educating, it was, it was kind of weird. It was like, I don't get it. Like, what are you talking about? Mm. And now people are like, there's a, there's an awakening that I'm seeing at least. And I think you're probably seeing this and, and the way we put yeah. stuff out, it's teaching people. But what I've seen, Justin, is that when people understand the biological pieces, like we've been talking about, yeah. I have not really worked with, like, I haven't had anybody be like, that's impossible. Like, there's no way. Like, no one is ever like, yeah, that's not real. Like, people feel it cellularly yeah. when they hear that truth. I, I found that to be true when I talk about the polyvagal ladder with my clients and mm -hmm. the people on the podcast. When I talk about, mm -hmm. you know, and they they just know it. It's like, they yes, know it. That's, the, that's it. And that's what I went through. And that. Yeah. yeah, like now it makes sense, and like it just—I don't. It doesn't. It's pretty simple. Yeah, what, you know, once you hear that, it's like ah. Uh. Yeah, yeah, it's ah, uh, and then I'll give the—I'll give the kind of the other side because I have worked with people that have gone, oh my god, but then they don't pursue it. Mm. So it's like you've opened Pandora's box, but then you decide to not deal with it. Um, it's—I'm a big Matrix fan. I don't know if you are, yeah. but. You know, like yeah, yeah, the yeah. moment you've taken the red pill or you even know the red pill is sitting there, it's going to be hard to keep living knowing that that exists. And I mean, there's a reason why that movie was brilliant. Yeah. It was ahead of his time. There's yeah. a reason why that one guy wanted to go back. He's like, I don't want to know. Yeah. And what's interesting with us humans at this point, we can't do that unless we have brain damage, which I hope for no one to ever have. Yeah, of course. We, we've been awoke, woken up to this. And so if you're listening to this now, like you have a responsibility to take this information and use it. That's my, you know, thing. I'm like, you've well, got they, they to. They can also, it. they can choose to leave it behind. 
Of course they can. They can. I, there's something <laughs> I noticed in my uh, my podcast stats. Um, ah. Episode one, where I lay out just the basics, yeah, is the highest listened to, and there's a dramatic drop off from from one to two. Now two through up to where we're at, still very high. Like I'm, yeah, a lot of people love it, but there's yeah. a huge cliff. Interesting. And it could be because episode one was horrible, or that once they hear it, it's like nope, and yeah, they really. And actually, I talked to someone who said I've listened to episode one a few times. Yeah, and I'm not ready to go to episode two. Sure. I've heard that a few times now, actually. That's, um, but once you hear it, I don't, I don't think you can unhear it. I couldn't stay away from it. You can't unhear it, and if you try to unhear it, it life's going to be pretty tough. I, I fully believe in alignment and things. You know, we we do create our fate, and we are meant to follow a path. And if a path comes in front of you, and yeah. you are drawn to it. And then all of a sudden you put the fear, like the, I can't, you stop the flow of the universe. If you want to even go that deep, I gotcha. you know, and it's like that path was given to you for a reason. Yeah. It's really scary. And you know what? There's a lot of people that have already gone down that path and they're on the other side and they're like, come here, come here, because it seems scary at the beginning. But if you do the work properly with people who understand and you have good support and you know it's not a quick fix, you'll get there and you'll be that much more liberated. I but found, if you, I'm sorry. you know, you go the you go the other side and it's like, I know about that path and I'm trying to walk yeah. this other one and it keeps teasing me, right? Sorry, go ahead. That was I found your uh, YouTube channel. I don't know how long ago it was. It was quite a while ago, and I was mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, you know, and mm -hmm. a part of me was like, no. There was a part of me that said no. Sure. And then I left it behind <laughs> and I found um, Dr. Portis and that was an instant mm -hmm. yes and just lit yeah. up. And then I found Peter Levine. And then I was like, oh yeah, Irene Lyon. Like it stuck in my mind. Sure. And I sought you out again. And I'm like, oh, now it makes more sense. Now I get it. Yeah. You know, but but that little spark, that little something was, it stayed within Yeah, me. it totally did. And you had to wait for that right timing and, and boom, here yeah. you are. Here we are, right? Some other and it, layer it, had to become unpeeled. Definitely. And then somewhere deep in my brain was, oh, yeah, I mean, lied. <laughs> ha. Cool. Um, How long ago was that? I'm curious. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I, I found Dr. Portis a little over a year ago. Yeah. And Peter Levine. Yeah. So sometime before that. Got it. Awesome. Cool. We've been talking for an hour and a half. I know we have more time. We have addressed mm -hmm. one of my questions. <laughs> 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 that I had specifically laid out. We, I'm sure Especially we touched was, upon. Yeah, I have a whole list of questions. I have, I've already forgotten what they are. <laughs> you had questions? <laughs> no, I had the list I gave of you, yeah. that I was looking at. So, but we touched upon a lot. I do want to, I want the follower questions. Yeah. Do you want to do like a, like a lightning round kind of thing? Like sure. A little, you up for it? Yeah, let's do it. Do you need a break? Nope. All right. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Um... Do you need a break? No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> okay, no, good. no, 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 no. All right. What's the difference between mind learning and learning on the nervous system level? They're the same, except for that you have to understand that the nervous system is more than one nervous system. So, you know, there's the autonomic nervous system. There's the somatic nervous system. There is the nervous systems that connect the gut and the brain. Um, there's, you know, there are many nervous yeah. systems. Yeah. And so, um, mind learning is within that because to be cognitive and use your mind, you have to have the other parts of your nervous system in a regulated state. So the mind can function at its highest level possible, if that makes sense. It makes total sense. So, so do you, well, but, but people typically see a split yeah. between okay. brain and mind and totally. my body, like my body versus yeah. my mind, which is somehow where I live or something like that. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, I don't know if you know, but as far as I know, nobody has actually been able to figure out where the mind is. So um, I like to think of it as cognitive thinking more so. Um, and I'll, I'll borrow from Peter, but, you know, someone once asked him the question, uh, is your, so your work, and this is the interviewer asking him, so your work is bottom up and he corrected him. He's like, no, the work isn't bottom up. It's all. <laughs> so it's bottom up, it's top down and it's all the in-betweens. And so there's this weird, um, myth that you go and do somatic therapy, 
right? If it's with me or someone and all you're doing is working with the body, it's like you can't separate the body from what's going on in the thoughts. And so a thought might come up, but Mm. it's like, okay, well, what happens when you notice that thought here? Or, and so we get into trouble or we're, we have gotten into trouble by being like, that's this therapist and that's this therapist. And, and for and me, medical, medical uh, models as well, right? Just when you go to a yeah. doctor, they send you to a specialist. Another, another side. Yeah. And so I think, sure, you have a broken bone, you go to the orthopedic surgeon, you know, okay. you, you, you know, yeah. there are certain things that are linear, but when it comes to the work we're talking about, right. In a perfect world, every single practitioner will understand how to work with the entire system. And the nervous systems run will run the front of the bus if they are in survival mode. Mm. Thank you. Perfect. You're welcome. Can healing the nervous system reverse? Actually, let me ask you this. Yep. Do you, I always use the word unstuck. Other people use healing. Mm. What Do you see a differentiation between the two? Do you use them differently? Does it matter to you? Healing to me is all is is either happening or it isn't. Okay. So like it's more existential this question. But it's like if you are working towards taking care of yourself, you're sleeping, you're you know, eating fairly well, you're getting activity, you have good relationships, or at least you're working towards that. Doesn't mean right. it's like perfect. Yeah. To me, that is you are in the healing zone. Like you're, I say you're, you're tuning on, turning on your healing DNA. But if you're doing things that are, let's say just the opposite of that, for lack of a better word, you're, you're not. And so it's like, you're either, you either are, or you aren't unstuck can happen or being stuck can occur when you're on that healing path. Right. It's what you do with it when it shows up, hmm. right? Um, so, I mean, I'll use a very quick example. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of our chat that my allergies have been popping up yeah. a little bit because of all the spores in the in the air because of all the rain. Um, and the last three nights, I haven't been able to sleep as well because my na- nose has been congested. So last night, I decided to take a Benadryl, which was a bad idea, but I'm like, hmm. I need to not be congested. And I mean, it, it worked. Uh, my, not, my sinuses were clear, but I felt a little icky when I woke up this morning. Does that mean that I've thrown myself off into like sub healing? No, it just means that, okay, I made a choice to take something. It didn't work out as I had planned. So today I need to do a few things to make sure I move, drink lots of water, okay. maybe have a nap this afternoon, you know, yeah. all. And so it's like that, but People think I'm so stuck, like I need to get unstuck. Right. Right? Right. That's kind of, it doesn't really work that way. Mm. Because the stuck is, stuck means lack of flow, essentially. So what I like to say is, rather than talking about stuck, what can happen so that we can bring more flow into your system? Okay. Right. What are the what are the things that have to occur to enable a little more, you know, if we think about the physiology, more circulation, that kind of I'm with you. And so for me, when I when I say stuck to me, that means it's temporary. And Mm -hmm. when I say when when I hear healing, I hear broken on. uh, Oh, interesting. Okay. And really, it's if I'm stuck in Mm -hmm. a defensive state, I'm not broken. I'm just stuck, stuck. And I will get unstuck if, you know, blah, blah, blah. Totally. Right. That's so that's. It's a semantic thing because then we could say, well, maybe the word we want is regulation of, you know, because regulation is at all at the end of the day. It's like, are you working towards regulation? Is the system regulated or is it dysregulated? We could agree on that. Yeah. Can healing the nervous system reverse medical problems like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome or autoimmune disorders? It sure can. So that's a bold statement. So this is not light. We got to go into this. (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I've, I've, I have clients, I have a husband, I have colleagues, myself, like I've, we've, I've seen people fully heal from these things. Um, and those people have done a shit ton of work. So yes, 
that's why I say you can, yeah. but just right, because right. you can doesn't mean someone will. And I know that might be a little shocking for some people to hear, but I have seen people who have gone through the work and done the work. They've gone through the motions, mm. but this goes back to what we first talked about a second ago about the mind, the thoughts. Um, sometimes folks, their psyches will be so strong that it will override all the good work right. they're doing with the physiology. Yeah. And I, you know, I wouldn't have said that maybe five years ago, but in my maturity and seeing people struggle and those who really do succeed at healing really deep chronic illnesses, like people have gone through the work that I've put together and their blood pan plant panels have changed like without any medication or changing your diet like autoimmune disorders which yep fibromyalgia mm -hmm. thyroid yes lupus definitely lupus. i haven't had anybody specifically that i've okay. that's talked about lupus but i also don't connect with all my students because it's online yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know but we'll i mean we'll get things like five years like we had someone recently like i just wanted to let you know that and then she's like all these things have changed it's like holy cow yeah. I, like I always think about like I know what we're talking mm -hmm. about can influence and bring like medical problems, mm -hmm. but in my mind it's always been, but not mm -hmm. all of them. Like there has to it, be some stuff we're I, just born with, right? Well, it depends how we define it. Like a okay. blood disorder, very different. Okay. Right, but from what we've seen, and again, this goes back to Peter's work, Porges's work, and Kathy Kane's work. My all my mentors really. Um, Porges being more a theoretical mentor, but, and then if we look at the ACE study, so the adverse right. childhood oh, totally. experience yeah, yeah, study, yeah, yeah. um, there's pretty damn conclusive evidence that dysregulation in the nervous system, having that autonomic cycling of high, high sympathetic fight flight with high, high dorsal shutdown. I can't do the opposite way that when those are living at the same time, for an extended period of time in the human system, it will breed what Peter has termed a syndrome, syndromal representation. And syndromal representation, at least in the somatic experiencing world and his world, and it's becoming more known and accepted, are these more chronic conditions, these autoimmune conditions, pain conditions, gut immune yeah. Um, migraine headache, horrific PMS, even things like cystitis, which is the bladder being inflamed. Because mm. basically what's occurring is our, our physiology is a bunch of vessels, right, that f need flow. And so if we think of something as simple as a digestive, as simple as a digestive system, <laughs> we want things to open and close in harmony, right? Open. And so I'm using my hands right now who, for those watching. It's like, open and close, open and close. We want there to be this nice regulation of the yeah. sympathetic and parasympathetic. But when we have got this stored traumatic stress or someone who didn't have that solid self-regulation attachment stuff that we were talking about before, their sympathetic might be like going a little bit faster. And then every now and again, the parasympathetic goes, boom, stop. Or the parasympathetic is going so high and the sympathetic just can't get up and out of that freeze because the freeze is so dominant, right? That kid that was just told that they were nothing and they just had to shut down. So all of that um, autonomic cycling of sympathetic and parasympathetic being kind of like in chaos where one is pumping more than the other. And you, it's like this symphony of chaos mm. within the mechanisms of the organs. Yeah. There's another piece to this. And so over time, like, sure, you could handle that for like a little bit, but most of these people are living like that from day yeah. one. Yeah. And because youth will help us heal, like our immune systems are stronger when we're young, things can stitch back up, things can heal. But there comes a point where the system's like, I give up. I can't keep repairing at this level. And then that's where we pop a chronic illness. Now, of course, how those illnesses show up are very are genetic. We're predisposed to things, oh, okay. so that's real. Gotcha. Um, but if you the, the one of the best books to read um, for those listening is Gabor Mate's yeah. book, "The Body Says No." Have you read that book? Not yet, no. 
Oh my God. So that, I mean, that is such, it's an older book, but get Mate was head of palliative care at Vancouver general hospital. Yeah. And he saw all these people dying of autoimmune diseases, super young. And when it really came down to it, they were people that were in that ACE category or they were hard on themselves or they, they, they were just living in that high level of dysregulation. And so when we're in high level dysregulation, we're living more, more or less in that high dorsal shutdown of the vagus nerve. And when we're in high tone dorsal, we don't have the good rest digest, no. low tone dorsal. And when we're in low tone do dorsal resting, our cells repair, our gut does something called barrier keeping. It's like imagine stitching everything back up. Okay. Right. So it, the, the lining of the gut is super thin and it gets worn down during our day to day happenings. And when we sleep and when we rest, it keeps it barriered. Okay. So cell regeneration, barrier keeping of the gut and, and, and what we would say in immune enhancing functions that basically send out the troops to kill viruses that are bad, cancer cells that, you know, are there. And if we have a lot of low torn dose dorsal, we upkeep pretty good, like the system ticks along. Yeah. But if we're in that shutdown, low tone dorsal isn't happening. And when we're in that deep shutdown, the immune system doesn't repair, the cells don't repair, the gut doesn't repair. And as we know, the gut is hugely important for health. Um, and so to go back to the question, these conditions I have seen them change significantly in clients to the point of people being 100% better. Of course, there's a spectrum. Um, and we also have to make sure there's nothing medical wrong, of course, which I believe in medicine for that reason specifically. Um, but yeah, if we get the system back into good regulation, the body actually knows how to heal. And so we then can kind of reverse engineer, so to speak, these things. So that's, that's my belief. Awesome. I've seen it. So there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. All right. How about tools to use when you, when you are triggered in public versus at home? If you mm. are become dysregulated in public versus at home. Hmm. Well, it depends on the person. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, if someone's dysregulated and the, well, let's rephrase this. Okay. A person is either dysregulated or they're not. So dysregulation is the theme of the body. Um, so if someone didn't have that early upbringing that was secure and attuned and they learned self-regulation, by the by, they are living in dysregulation all the time. Right. They have a right, very right. thin window of tolerance, right, for anything big. Right. And so I might say mm. when someone's out in public and they're triggered or they're activated, right, so they're more activated than their regular low-level dysregulation, yeah. you have to know, and this is where it comes back to the education, do I need to connect to somebody or do I need to go into the bathroom stall and sit on the toilet and yeah. like squeeze my arms? Right. You know, yeah. so it depends on the person. It depends on what they need. Cause maybe, um, there's someone who had bad people around them growing up. So connecting with people is actually more yeah. scary than being alone. Yeah. So they really have to know what works. They for them. have to know. And yeah. Does that just come from experimentation? Just checking mm -hmm. with your body throughout the day, and how, like, how do I feel around this person or all the people, or how do I feel alone in my room? Or my experience um, is, it takes a little bit more than that. I mean, okay. that's you know, to 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 put in a little plug for what I do, my programs. We bring people through all the resourcing, orienting capacity holding, containing, working with the kidney adrenals, working with the gut, working with the brainstem, learning how to make sounds to stimulate the vagus nerve, 
like super comprehensive. Just, it's very comprehensive yeah. because you know it's so hard for me, Justin, because I want to say to someone, yeah, as soon as you feel triggered, just do this. Right. And that's what they want. <laughs> and that, and I get it. Like I want but, that too. <laughs> but it's like, uh, you know. But at the end of the day, you have to understand. Just like we are born and raised in an environment, something that might work for you at home. Maybe mm. when you're at home and you're triggered, it's just good to shake and just let it out and mm -hmm. ah, and breathe. But maybe to do that in the public would be terrifying. Mm -hmm. And so you need to figure out, well, what can I do that will help my physiology come down? And that's, that is trial and error. And that's being experimental and curious. Right. Like one of the things is like, can you stop long enough to feel your feet on the ground and just get curious with what's happening because of our mind or whatever's up here that gives us thoughts. The moment we feel a trigger, we have a very short window of time between that trigger creating more activation or that trigger um, deactivating. And if we can be with it, like it's like, huh, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to steal one of my mentors words, Josh Pice. He's like, can you party with that sensation? Like, <laughs> like have a little party with it. Like what's going on? You know, like, what are you doing? Like what? Like, Oh, I feel you heart rate. You're going up right now. Isn't that interesting? Like, Oh, you you want me to touch you? Okay. You know, I mean, and you can have that conversation in yeah. your head yeah. so that you're diverting the fear response. That's going to bring you potentially into more activation and then your day is done kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Makes sense? It does. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Why does stress cause such exhaustion? Kind of like what I was talking about when I was talking about the importance of flow and sympathetic and parasympathetic and sympathetic is going and parasympathetic is going. And by that, I mean like survival energy. So survival energy is when our fight, flight, and freeze is kind of what well, not is. That's what they are, our survival energies, this needing to fight, yeah. mobilize, or shut down. That, that energy, those survival mechanisms take a lot of energy. Like they're there for survival. It's like mounting all the swords and we're, you know, we're gonna go out into battle and fight. And so that's exhausting. And they're, like supposed that, to be, they're supposed to be short term. Like five seconds. Like our survival stress is meant to only be on for a few seconds. And what occurs to go to stress, exhaustion, and then I'll link it to adrenal fatigue because um, I can is when we, when our body realizes, hmm, little Johnny, if we go back to little Johnny, like he's <laughs> always, you know, he's always adrenalized. Like, or little, you know, what, you know, I'm all, I'm always fighting. I'm always fleeing. I'm always having to shut down. Yeah. It doesn't make sense anymore to just secrete adrenaline because adrenaline is fast acting. It gets released, it poof, does its thing, and then it, mm -hmm. we pee it out. Mm -hmm. Cortisol, on the other hand, is long acting. It's a steroid and hormone. And so when the system is like, well, this is not efficient. It's not efficient to keep releasing adrenaline over mm -hmm. and over again we're going to release cortisol because it lasts for like hours and hours and hours and it'll take care of things. It'll put us into prep mode for survival over time. That cortisol, as we know, is toxic to the tissues. It's toxic to the brain and it's what eventually eats and creates toxicity in our systems. We can't heal when we're in that high level of cortisol survival. Yeah. We need cortisol in small doses, but when it's constantly there, not good. And then if we keep on that path of not learning how to fully come down and regulate yeah. and heal the system, um, we eventually burn out of that cortisol and our kidneys, which are two little kidneys in the adrenal gland that sits on top. They literally become like dry shrivel shriveled up raisins and so, or prunes, plums. And so what occurs is there's just no more chemical to get us going at all. Right. And people who are living in that state of kind of chronic health conditions, often yeah. they'll, they'll have flatline cortisol. There's no flow in the day. It's just, it's exhausted. So when people call 
say burnout or adrenal exhaustion, adrenal fatigue, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's, that, that's what's happening at that physiological level is the body has just been pumping out so much and it's literally given up. And so there's no more sympathetic juice to get ourselves going. Um, and that's why you can't yeah. say to someone who has this level of fatigue, like real chronic fatigue, just go out for a walk. Yeah. It doesn't work. And it's because the system has been so badly abused with stress and fighting and hypervigilance that it's like, I'm out. So what's, what's the first step for someone who's in that well, place? Well, same. So it comes back to education. And then when I work with my folks, it's building capacity through reconnecting to the physiology. Um, the, I call them neurosensory exercises. We reintroduce resources, how to orient properly, how to follow impulses. One of the best practices, um, that people come back to over and over again, I call it following impulses. And that isn't like to just eat all the cookies in the cookie jar impulse. It's, it's the impulse of, I have to go to the bathroom right now. I'm going to go. Yeah. Um, I'm thirsty. I'm a bit tired. Like, and yeah. actually following that impulse. Yeah. Because if we can listen to our biology at that level, it's an entry point. Yeah into then listening to the deeper parts of our stress physiology that take a little bit more practice and a little bit more work. Um, and then if I take a little further, um, and this is um, what I've learned through Kathy Kane's work, somatic practice, is we I actually get people to work when it's online, visualizing and being with their kidney adrenals. If you see me for private practice, um, which I don't do anymore, but I did forever, um, I'm actually, my hands are actually not holding, but connecting to that area of the kidney adrenal, inviting safety, inviting energy, inviting flow, letting that system know that, holy cow, it's been a hard life and you've done so much and we're just going to chill here and be cool with that. And that kind of work that she does that I've learned that my colleagues do, it is miraculous what that what, what happens okay. when you just work at that kidney adrenal level, because it then, um, ricochets up to the hypothalamus, which also secretes all the other stress chemicals through the pituitary gland and all that. And so working at that direct level, um, with time and practice, uh, it, it's amazing work Sounds because like it. yeah, it's amazing work. So that was a long way of if saying. If anybody <laughs> doubts your trauma nerd cred, that should clear it up. Wow. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, the body being in constant flight fight is its baseline. We, we've kind of talked about that. Do you yeah. have any other thoughts you'd like to share about that? I mean, we just kind of covered that. Like yeah. if you're constant fight, flight, freeze, yeah. you will burn out. Like okay. metaphorically, physically, yeah. literally, yeah, what, mentally. What if someone does not have the space, the time, or the support they need to heal or to become mm -hmm. unstuck or to regulate what, like they don't have these things. They go home to a place that's not safe. That's tough. Or not connected. Like what yeah. is, there, is there any hope for someone who literally has no other external resource? Yes. The main key. And of course what they can seek out. Sadly now it's financial often, you know, like, it's this is not covered by any government subsidy the work we do right. um especially what you do therapy on some level no, but no, no not at all i mean unless someone's already a psychotherapist and then they bill out but but even here's the thing even doing one-on-one -on -one work every week for a year from what i've seen is not enough and the reason why is because you go to the office, you have a great session, mm -hmm. you have to be practicing when you're not there. Yeah. And that's a big reason why I stopped my private practice is things were getting better, but I'm like, this isn't enough. Like they need, the people need to be studying this, like the way they prepare meals every day. You know, like it's, it's that, it has to be that insidious in our system. Uh, yeah. Are you saying for even people who are high performers or who, are, who have a lot of motivation that even that those people might lapse when it comes to this? Oh, even more. I see the smile on your face. <laughs> because, well, I'm, I'm one of those, right? So it's ah. like your, if your willpower, if your will structure was to just push and I'm yeah. so good at this, that 
is causing survival stress. And so for those people that are high performers to tell them, just don't do anything for a few hours. What? Mm. Well, I could go up for a walk. It's like, no, just have a bath and then lay in bed for 20 minutes and breathe. What? Like that causes panic. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. even those folks, you know, I'm one of them constantly working with it. They, the physiology doesn't ever go away. And so we if, might if have a really, not building a practice around this. Like if exact, not, okay. our awareness, our self-awareness to self has to be on all the time. And the thing is that we don't need it as much as humans because we're not out in the wild having to be attentive to every footstep, every crack yeah. of the trees. Um, we're, we get lazy around that because we actually can not pay attention and be okay we get to watch uh, tv and ignore all that stuff yeah totally and and here's the thing nothing wrong with binging some netflix on Grey's anatomy <laughs> but you know are you doing it in complete disconnection from your body right like can that watching you mean... a show be an embodied experience as opposed okay. to i'm doing this to numb out okay yeah because i don't want to feel what's going on i mean that's the basis yeah. for addiction is numbing out it stuff is, yeah. that's too much to feel. And so I forget what the original question was, but um, this capacity to, what was the question again, Justin? <laughs> People who are chronically, uh, oh, if you don't have the place, the time, oh, right. the person. So, perfect. Yeah, I wanted to get back to that. So the thing is, this is what I've seen. I've had people go through my work who are totally well-supported, they have every every resource that they want. I've had people who are in second world countries who barely can make ends meet. The difference or what occurs, it has to do with someone's, not only their belief that they can heal. Totally. But, this is a big but, their capacity to believe that they deserve to heal. Go and on. if if we if and if we were brought up in that environment where we were not accepted for who we are, go you know that long convo we had yeah. about that, there will be a very strong interject, a very strong belief statement. I don't deserve anything. I don't deserve to be happy. I don't deserve to feel good about myself. My parents were in this war and there was no food and how dare I have this good life and be healthy and vibrant and have a job that I love. That's like, boom. And so if that, you know, I'm being extreme, but if that's running our psyche, we will find ways to sabotage everything yeah. in terms of healing. And so I've worked with people and had experiences with people who can't afford my work. You know, they can't buy one of my programs or they can't do one-on-one -on -one therapy with one of my colleagues. And we get people writing who have gone through the basics, who have watched the videos and done some of the free resources yeah, yeah. and they've treated it like their study. Yeah, yeah. And because we actually have the innate capacity to feel these things, if their mindset is like, I'm going to do this, God damn it, because I really deserve to be well they'll find a way. And I've also found mm. that when we get that mentality, things open up for what we, like people will come into our lives that are supportive. We will find that yeah, money. Yeah. We will find that space yeah. to go and have a really good um, dance class that's trauma informed. I mean, all these things will fall in, but if we keep mm -hmm. the mentality of I'm stuck, I don't deserve anything. I was a victim. Um, I'm never going to get any better then yeah, you probably won't. It's like a cap you place over your, my image is it's like it's a cap on the bottle, like you've put the cap on. Yeah, so that will stay there. Yeah, totally. And I think it's important for people to know that in some people it rubs the wrong way. Um, but we've all had our share of bad stuff that have happened to us. You know, I don't like to make one person's trauma bigger than the other. And the most that we can do is like, hey, this is what I've got. This is what I have. Yeah. What can I do that's going to help? I call that like again the image in my head is um bumper lanes on a uh yeah, yeah. Lane. like these are yes. my lanes these yes. are my lanes no matter what situation it is and how do yep. I best work within my lanes Totally And I think if there's the mind can 
you know, see the potential, like I said a moment ago, things can open up beyond what we might not even imagine, right? So yeah. I think belief is big, but deserving is even bigger. I like it. Yeah. All right. Our two hours is up. <laughs> it's quite a marathon. Thank you. I know. I know. It's you good. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm fine. I do have to go pee, but, you know, that's... <laughs> There's an Speaking impulse there. Calling, There's an impulse. I'm okay. Well, thank but you. I've been talking a lot. Yeah. Thank you um, so much for your time, yeah. your wisdom, your sharing, and being so open oh. about this. What should... What do you have coming out or what do you have out that people should be very interested in? Sure. Well, um, I typically run um, my big program. It's called Smart Body, Smart Mind yeah. once a year. Um, it's a big production, so we only can run it once a year. It's That's an this... in-person thing? No, it's online. Okay. okay. Yeah, so it's called Smart Body, Smart Mind. Um, and it was birthed actually um, out of me in private practice making audio homework exercises for my clients and writing and making um, like screen slide or PowerPoint presentations to teach them the biology because it was not making sense for me to sit down with each person yeah. where they're paying me $200 yeah. an hour to yeah. draw pictures when they could just do it <laughs> at home. So what, oh, you know, over the course of many years, I put more and more resource into this program and um, that runs once a year. It usually runs in spring. Um, next year, I'll date this, okay. is 2020. So we start March 1st. Is there a cap to that as far as how many people can participate? At this point, we haven't had to cap it. Okay. And and the reason why is because it's not one-on-one. -on -one, it's right. group. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the curriculum is set. Um, it's 12 weeks, but that does not mean that you are done in 12 weeks. People that go into it, they have the course for life, so they can work through it. Um, people can come back and join us the next year, alumni free of charge. Um, nice. and of course, you know, priority goes to the newbies for yeah. questions. We do group calls. I do a lecture training call like this on zoom. Very we cool. have Q and A's, um, and we have an amazing Facebook group where my team and everyone is trained in somatic experiencing most in Kathy Kane's work and in other various somatic modalities, they moderate nice. and answer questions. So it's pretty com It's comprehensive. Is this something that people show up? to on zoom or is it a curriculum they get that they watch and then participate in like in a group it's both so okay. the training calls are live but they're recorded and then of course they're there for people to watch after the fact um just because the time zone differences okay. um but yeah everything it's like a website everything is loaded up onto the site and then week by week we drip out one i call them lab so there's 10 labs over the course of 12 weeks we have movement lessons in there um, so the other thing I do in addition to the online, um, and there's one other program called the 21 day nervous system tune up, which is a self study course that was curated from SBSM, um, smart body, smart mind. So that during the year, if someone comes across this work, they don't have to wait until the Ooh. next year because yes. a lot can change in six months, Absolutely. right? If you're on a verge of a, of an illness coming up, that can pop within any time. And so if someone can start working on themselves, they can mitigate something getting worse. So that's the other online portion. And then I teach live workshops um, that are more based, and we didn't get into this, but my work and studies with the Feldenkrais method. Yeah. And um, a lot we didn't get into, we didn't get Yeah, into. I know. I'll have to do another talk. <laughs> I hope so. So yeah. the, the, the work that I do there, I used to teach group classes and that thing. Um, small classes here in Vancouver, but I've collaborated with a gentleman from Seattle. His name is Elia Emrak, and he is trained in dance, hip hop, b-boy, break dance, qigong, tai chi, Eastern medicine. And so we met about nine years ago and we collaborated forces. And so our um, in-person event, usually about three days, is called Up and Down. And what that is, to go into that a tiny bit, is and I don't know if you know this, but our capacity to stay healthy, of course, in addition to the nervous system work, but functional independent and independent, like physically is determined by whether or not we can go down to the floor and back up again without aid. So interesting. we were teaching our workshops, doing lots of Feldenkrais and movement and games. It's so fun, so much fun. Um, and we started to realize we we're trying to call it all these fancy names 
I'm like, all we do for three days is we go up and we go down and we roll and we go up and we sit. And what happens, um, if some people are like, well, how does that have to do with the nervous system? It has everything to do with the nervous system because we're not just getting people to move like exercise move. We're having people be very mindful, very attentive and very calculated with their movement and changing the tone of the movement so it's more regulated. Mm -hmm. And then because all the nervous systems connect, when you regulate the somatic motor neuro ner nervous system, so what governs our ability to move and twist and turn, it directly influences the other nervous systems. So that's something that I do. We, we run workshops all around the world and heading to Stockholm and the UK in a few weeks. Wow. We'll be in California at the end of the year in December. Cool. Um, yeah, so it's fun. So those are the other workshops. And then, of course, I've got my blog, which is how you found me, and articles. And I do some online drop-in classes. There's a lot going on. A lot going on. Okay. Lot <laughs> I will have links to as much as I possibly can down below. Uh, thank you again so much for, for all this. You are so welcome. Thank you for doing your work too, Justin. All right, bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you so much for checking out both parts of my chat with Irene Lyon. She donated two hours of her time, so do me a favor, please, and hit her up and just say, hey, thank you uh, for being on the Polyvagal Podcast and let her know what you got out of it. Um, I think that will mean a lot to her. Uh, Thank you so much for checking out both parts of my chat with Irene Lyon. She donated two hours of her time, so please do me a favor and reach out to her and just let her know, hey, thank you so much for being on the Polyvagal Podcast, and let her know what you got out of it. I think it'll mean a lot to her. My favorite part of our chat, well, there was, there was a lot. There was a lot that I liked a lot, but uh, she and I did not completely agree on consequences when it comes to parenting, but I love that she gave us such a very simple and honestly very effective technique uh, when working with aggression of channeling that energy outward. And I've started doing that with my son. He's four years old and we've, um, he likes, he loves it. He loves it. It's been a fantastic and very simple technique to help him focus his, his, uh, more aggressive energy in a positive way that actually builds relationship between him and I, because it's, it's a game. So, uh, that was the most beneficial piece I got from this possibly, even though there's a ton that was really, really good. That's something I've started implementing, uh, with my, with my child. And uh, we don't do consequences very often, but I'm doing this now, and I think I'll use consequences probably even less often. So thank you for that, Irene. I really do appreciate that. If you absolutely must have more Polyvagal Podcast content, go to justinlmft.com slash members. For five bucks a month, we have even more Polyvagal Podcast content, and we're adding to that every week pretty much. So there's lots and lots of stuff coming out. Thank you so much for checking out my chat with Irene Lyon and listening to the Polyvagal Podcast.